California court, two men were on trial for armed robbery. An eyewitness took the stand and the prosecutor got up to begin his questioning. First, he asked the eyewitness, you were at the scene of the robbery? Yes, answered the witness. You saw a vehicle leave at a high rate of speed? Yes. Did you observe the occupants? Asked the prosecutor, yes. The prosecutor in a booming prosecutor voice said, and are those two men in this courtroom today? At this point, the defendants sealed their fate. They both raised their hands. When it comes to guilt, let's admit it. All of us at some point in our lives have to honestly say, I did it. There are things we all have struggled with that results in guilt. We're all in the same boat. Today is the final message in a series I called Grace 101. We have been taking an introductory level look at the meaning of grace. The number one enemy of grace is guilt. I know we've touched on this before, but I wanted to, in this final message, to wrap this up because guilt is the number one enemy of grace. When we allow guilt to overwhelm us, we can miss out on the gift of grace. We got the bad news in our scripture reading this morning. That's why I had Ed read it. I wanted him to read the bad news, right? This is the bad news about the law. I am talking about living a life with the Ten Commandments as our guide. James 2 verse 10 says this. And by the way, would you pull out your sermon outlines? There's some scripture verses we'll be looking at together this morning. You can kind of follow along in the message and take some notes. But James 2 verse 10 says this. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. Now, when someone commits a crime, they deserve to have this. The consequences happen to them. This is justice. But what James is writing about here is God's kind of justice. Recognizing the fact that whether it is one sin or many in our lives, We have all slipped, we have all sinned, and we are all in the same boat. This is the bad news. But here is the good news about grace. 1 John 1, 7 says this, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. This is the good news about grace. So let's look together about dealing with guilt. The first thing we need to understand is that a healthy approach to guilt must begin with the idea that guilt is a warning light. It is sort of like those check engine lights in your car. A sensor picks up a problem and transmits it so that a tiny light comes on in your your dashboard. And if that sensor is correct, then you know there's a problem, right, with your engine. Sometimes, though, those sensors can be wrong, can't they? I drove one car about seven years with a check engine light on. (laughs) After a while, it gets easy to ignore it. The same can be true with guilt. I signed up for this scripture service called Word to You that texts my cell phone with one scripture verse each day. It is a great way for me to get more of of God's word in my life. And I like it because I'm not selecting the scripture. I don't know what's going to come and I can get that text. and And I read this verse on my cell phone a while back. It says, Psalm 38, verse 4. Let's read this out loud together. It's it's in your sermon outlines. It's on the screen. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. Every one of us knows that overwhelmed, burdened feeling. The feeling of, I hope nobody finds out. Now, Now, is this 
the only purpose of guilt in our life? I mean, is it something we're supposed to live with for the rest of our lives? No getting past it. No, no guilt is supposed to be a warning light, not a lifetime sentence. You hear me? Guilt is supposed to be a warning light, not a lifetime sentence. It is a warning light to tell us that something needs to get fixed. And so we go get fixed. It's telling us, you need some time with God. You need God to heal this. Now, we make a distinction between genuine guilt and false guilt. There are two different kinds, and we need to identify the kind of guilt we are dealing with when we experience guilt. There is genuine guilt, the real deal. We all have dealt with that, that the genuine guilt that comes from the fact that we have all done wrong things that have hurt ourselves, hurt others, and hurt the heart of God. That is the honest truth. Unless we are perfect, and none of us are, we have all had to deal with this real thing of guilt, this, this feeling of genuine guilt. There is another brand of guilt that is very important to understand if you're going to get past this and find God's grace in the midst of, us, in the midst of it. That is called, it's called false guilt. That involves thinking that maybe there might be a light on the dashboard that comes on and you're so, so worried about it that you worry yourself into a false guilt. The feeling is like this. If a light on the dashboard ever came on, what would people think of me? There are many people who deal with this false guilt. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard people say something like this. I just have this overwhelming feeling of guilt. I, I don't know where it comes from. I, I can't really put my thumb on it. I, I don't know the source of it. But I just feel bad. If you are dealing with false guilt, you are probably sending yourself a lot of mental text messages. And they read something like this. You think that's enough? You call that acceptable? Look at all the things you haven't gotten finished. You have disappointed the people that are around you. That's the kind of things you are hearing a lot if you are dealing with false guilt. We need to understand that often false guilt in our lives, if we struggle a lot with this, is a result of incidences that may not have been your fault. Some of the people who struggle the most with false guilt struggle because they were caught up in the circle of someone else's sin at some point in their lives. It may be a parent, a friend, a physical, mental, or emotional abuse, but somehow, maybe even at an early age, you were caught up in the cycle of someone's sin, and you feel that you just can't get that out of your life. Maybe it was even one of your own children. You feel like because of what they have done, that's come upon your life. Uh, there are also times that, that, that false guilt is there because you just can't, can't get past your past. This is what I hear people say when they're feeling this way. I've asked God a thousand times to forgive me, and I just can't feel forgiven. That's when you can't get past your past. Probably all of us have, have dealt in some ways with false guilt. What we need to understand today is that false guilt is very popular among churchgoers. It's a great thing in church. It produces a faith that is more walls than doors. There's no way out. It, it closes in on you. It's been a problem for those who've been trying to find the truth of God for a long time. Way back in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul talks to some people who are struggling with false guilt, trying to make themselves better by doing a lot of good things. He wrote to them in Galatia and said, Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? 
This is the sign of what happens when we struggle with false guilt. We, we can't feel forgiven by God, so we try to, to, to more and more to make it better by our own power. I think one of the best things we can do as we talk about guilt is to talk about how to identify the difference. How do you know the difference between true guilt and false guilt? How do you know if it is God speaking to you or is it your mean grandmother? Anybody have a mean grandmother? Or your fourth grade teacher who called you stupid in front of the whole class? Or was it Brother Bob from some Pentecostal church saying you don't measure up? Is this where the guilt is coming from? How do you know who it is who is really speaking to you? Here is how. Genuine guilt always draws you closer to God. It draws you close like a magnet so that you are seeking God first and foremost. False guilt is when you're trying to please others. When you're striving to meet someone else's approval. That fourth grade teacher is not going to care about how you are doing right now. Your mean grandmother is not going to be impressed about how much of a better person you have become. It will wear you out. Do not live your life to please others. When it comes to genuine guilt, God will point you to something specific. Every time you turn around, you will be reminded of what you need to do. Man, I need to fix that. When it is false guilt, it is always something kind of cloudy or vague. Let's go back to that warning light on the dashboard of your life. What are you going to do when that light goes off? Well, here's how the first couple dealt with it, Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, the Bible tells us they first sewed fig leaves together and made something to cover themselves. Then they hid from the Lord God. And then when challenged, Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked. She gave me some fruit from the tree, so I ate it. There are three ways they respond, and these are the ways we often respond. First, we respond with shame. We feel bad. Second, hiding. You know, if you ever read that story again, they hid in the bushes from God as if God couldn't see them there, you know? And you remember when your kids were little, they play hide, hide, go seek, you know, you play hide, go seek, and they're like standing behind a curtain, you can clearly see their pants and shoes, you know, and they think they're invisible. That's sort of like how Adam and Eve was. They, they thought they could hide from God as if God couldn't see them there. That is like, you know, sort of like, and I hate to admit this, but I did this at one car, taping over the light on the dashboard. You ever did that? <laughs> That red light, I'm just tired of looking at. I got some black tape and taped it over. And I'm just pretending that nothing is really wrong. It doesn't work, by the way. But they, but they try that. Adam and Eve, they try that. They, they hit out. And the third is blame. This is a popular one. It's sort of tragic, a humorous story in a way, what happens in Genesis. You've got Adam and Eve and the serpent standing there, and God comes, and God asks Adam, did you eat that fruit of the tree? Remember the story? It was paradise, and all God said was, is this just one particular tree? Not all the trees, but this one particular tree, don't eat of the fruit of the tree, and so he's confronted and Adam took it like a man and he blamed his wife. You ever catch that? <laughs> My wife Jenny loves to point that out. He points right at Eve. She did it. It's her fault. She gave me the fruit. So Eve's standing here, blamed too. But notice if you read carefully, you know what does she do? She points at the serpent, right? Right? The serpent, the serpent did it. Of course, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on, right? 
I am so glad you laughed at that. I, I worked hours on that one. Isn't it easy to try to blame your way out of the wrong things that have happened? We all do this. Well, none of these ways work. Grace, number two, grace is God's way of handling guilt. Grace is God's way of handling guilt. 1 John 1 verse 9 says this. Let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at this verse. 1 John 1 verse 9, it says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Circle if we confess our sins. That's the first step. If we confess our sins, that's part of dealing with guilt. That's part of God's grace. Circle, he is faithful and just. You see that there? He is faithful and just. Seeing how true that is, it is also part of grace and how it works. Circle will forgive us. That, that's how we deal with the guilt that makes us sick and, and splits us up and, and tears us apart. Steps to handling guilt. This is on the back of your outlines. Number one, confess your sins. You say, God, I did it. I confess my sin. And you stop. And you're sincere. And you mean it. Not just our need, our sin. Not just our frustration, our sin. Not just our problems, our sin. What does that word mean, sin? There's a lot of fancy definitions out there. The easiest way to understand it for me is to look at the middle letter in the word. Sin is all about I. It's all about my way. It's about me saying to God, excuse me, but I'm going to live my life my own way. I have my own plans. It is about me looking at the dashboard and saying, it looks okay to me, so I am leaving you out. That is what it is all about. Whether you look very moral in the world's eyes or very immoral, you can still have that I right in the middle of your life, leaving God out. That, that, is, that is what sin is all about. Tell God, God, I left you out. Because of it, I messed up, and it messed up my life up. That's what it means to confess. When it comes to sin, we do one of two things, cover up or face up. We try to cover it up and pretend it is not there or we face up to it. When you face up to it, the number one thing we need to do is to tell God we are facing up to it. How do you confess your sin? You tell God. You might as well tell God because God already knows. So it's not like God's going to be surprised. Wow. But there's something about a relationship with God that, that God wants us to tell. This is what makes our relationship to God unique. When we confess our sins to God. Now, why not be honest about it? Psalm 69 verse 5 says this. says, you God know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. You see that on the screen? There is nothing more difficult than trying to hide something that cannot be hidden. There is nothing more wearying, nothing costlier. Why try to hide it from God? Tell him. Be honest with him. Telling God, confessing to God, means more than just admitting. The literal meaning of this word is saying the same thing about you. You say to God, I, I agree with you about this. It is wrong and it hurts. I agree with what you think about this sin. I agree with what you think about this wrong that I have done. How do you do that? How do you tell God? You do it through prayer. You can talk to God. Even right now where you are seated, just start to talk to God about it. God will listen. 
Talk to God about the things you have done. Just make a list of the things that come to mind. Some of you might want to do this in a more visible way. I have found it to be a very healthy thing to do. Sit down with a piece of paper and write down the sins that come to mind, whether you feel like they are true guilt or false guilt. Just write them down. And after you've written them down, do something very visual. Take this verse, 1 John 1, 9. It's right here on the front page of your outline. And take this verse over each of those sins. And then take that paper that you've written all that stuff down and burn it up. Get rid of it. And it visually says to you, God forgave that sin. He's willing to forgive that sin. His grace covers my sin. Tell God. Write that down. Read 1 John 1, 9 and just crumble up that paper and throw it away. Get rid of it. The Bible also encourages us to, to also tell a trusted friend. There's something healing about this. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so God can heal you. You may have told God a hundred times, but never told anyone else. Because of that, you are still struggling with guilt that keeps coming up about that sin. There's something healing about telling a trusted friend. It's got to be the right person, but when you tell the right person, it takes that sin that looks so big when you keep it in the dark, when you keep it hidden, when you don't tell anyone, and it shrinks it down to size. You tell somebody else and, and they say, oh yeah, I've struggled with that too. And all of a sudden you realize, I'm not alone. I'm not so impressed with this sin anymore or depressed by it, I realize that we all struggle with the same thing. There's something healing about realizing I'm not alone in this. We all struggle with the same thing. We all need God's forgiveness. It's one of the healing things that come. So confess to God and tell a trusted friend. The second part of 1 John 1, 9 reminds us to really experience God's grace. We not only have to confess our sins, but we need to, number two, trust God's character. Many people confess their sins, but really never get to know the God who is forgiving them. Because of that, they never feel the forgiveness of that God wants to give. Now, I've got a, a series of, of, of scripture verses here in your sermon outlines. I just want to read these to you. I want you to think about this. Hebrews 10 verse 22 says this. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Do you see what happens when we trust God's character? We can have that refreshing rinse, that, that cleansing power of God's grace. Psalms 46, verse 1 to 2. It's wonderful. Let's read this one out loud. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. You see, no matter what happens, we can trust God's character. I know my friend Ernie, he, I know his earth, his world has fallen away. And he's, he is shaken to the core. I, I could hear it in his voice as we cried together on the phone this morning. But we're going to trust God's character. We're going to trust God to get him through it and everyone who goes through suffering. We will not fear. Trust God's character. Take a look at this one. Psalm 118 verse 6. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. You know, when God is with you, no matter what we're, what we're challenging, what we're facing, God is going to get us through. When God is with me, we, there's no need to be afraid. The Lord goes with me. I'm not frightened. 
It's like having the Incredible Hulk next to you for your sci-fi fans or Marvel fans. There's no need to be afraid. And God is with you. Isaiah 41 verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, can I explain how God's going to do that in your situation in life? I have no, I can't. I don't know. I, I don't know what you're going through right now. I, I don't know all the challenges that you're facing, physical challenges and illnesses and, and family members who are hurt and what heartache that brings you to, to church today. I, I don't know what that is, but I believe that God does. And when you trust God's character, somehow, some way, God is going to pull you through. Amen? Amen? Matthew 14, 27, Jesus immediately said to them, you know, take courage. It is I... Don't be afraid. And because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, he's beside us today just as he was with his disciples. There's a wonderful story in Numbers in the, in the Old Testament of Joshua and Caleb. And, and the Israelites had been in the desert for a long, long time. And they were just right there at the promised land so Moses decided to send 12 spies into the land to check it out, to find out, is it truly a land flowing with milk and honey? Are there fruits? You know, is there produce? What's, what's the environment like? And what about the people living there? You know, are there, are there walls? Are, are there cities walled? You know, and so Moses sent out these 12, 12 spies, one from every tribe, and, and they went out and they brought back some samples of some uh, gorgeous grapes and other fruit that they found. And it truly was a tremendous land. And so they, all the people were gathered together and they had the 12 spies report. And 10 of the 12 spies said, we cannot conquer these people. Some of them are giants. And the more they talked, the more exaggerated they, 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 it got. And, and the people were all in uproar. And they kept saying to Moses, like they said many times, why did you drag us out of here, out of Egypt, so that we can be slayed by these giants, by these people, you know? But Caleb, two of the spies, did not give, give that false report. They, they, they did not give a negative report. Here's what Caleb said. Caleb said, we should attack now and take the land. We are strong enough to conquer it. And then later on, Joshua says, the land we explored is an excellent land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will take us there and give us that rich and fertile land. And the people were frightened and afraid. And if you read that story in Numbers 13 and 14, and, and Moses had, had to kind of appeal to God again, you know, and say, God, don't strike us all dead. You know, we're going to trust you. And God says, I'm going to save Joshua and Caleb. You know, sometimes, friends, in life, we get a report back, right? And 10 of the 12 reports say, it's bad. It's over. We're not, you're not going to make it. You can't get through it. You're never going to see the end of this challenge. God is not here. God doesn't exist. That's what 10 reports are going to say. But we've got to trust God. And even though they were in the minority, right, the people of Israel went forward. And they discovered that some of these big so-called giants were, were no problem at all. Instead, they trusted God's character. So I don't know what kind of reports you're getting from your spies and your promised land that you're looking into. But whatever you do, don't always go with the majority. Instead, trust God's character. And in the end, God will get you through. And number three, accept God's forgiveness. This is so big. So many people miss this point. We can know about God's forgiveness. We can believe that God forgives us, right? We can teach that God forgives us. But we have to accept it. We have to accept God's forgiveness. 
And friends, if, if people in Elkhart County could accept God's forgiveness right now, it would change everything. All so many ills that, that, that invade our lives could be cured if people understood just how much God loved them. And they would accept God's forgiveness. Take a look at these verses. John 3, verse 18. Whoever believes in me, whoever believes in him is not condemned. If you believe in Jesus, no matter what you've done, and you've sought forgiveness for those sins, you are not condemned. And Psalm 32, verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Don't forget, when you're dealing with guilt, to accept God's offer of forgiveness. Accept it. Make it real in your heart. Not just in your mind, but with your heart. Let us pray. Take a moment to talk to God about what we've talked about today. Admit your sins to God. Talk to him in your heart and say something like this. Father, I confess my sins to you today. I agree with you. I've done wrong things. They've hurt me. They've hurt others. They've hurt you. I'm tired of trying to make up for them on my own. Would you forgive me? Thanks for sending Jesus to die on the cross so they could be forgiven. Thank you that he paid the penalty for my sins. I trust you. I trust your character today. You're faithful. You will forgive me. Today, as best as I know how, I accept your forgiveness into my life. Help me to begin to live out the life of grace. Some of you, you may have prayed that prayer a long time ago, but you need to pray this morning. Father, help me to live your life by grace and not guilt. Help me to step into the fresh air of your grace today. It's a little scary, but today I'm making a commitment to take you at your word and to trust you. All my guilt is gone. In Jesus' name, amen.